Welcome back. Uh, now we're going to go to our first virtual uh, podcast segment uh, ever uh, out of the, uh, this is our sixth one, uh, our sixth podcast. So we're going to do this uh, immediately. And we're going to go all the way across the United States to Washington, D.C., to the headquarters of the ATA. And Natalia, uh, would you please introduce our next guest? Of course, Frank, that is correct. Um, we do have our second guest coming all the way from Washington, D.C., the Executive Vice President of Advocacy for the American Trucking Associations, Mr. Bill Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Bill, for being here. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, and Frank, great to see you as always. Great to see you. And then I see that you got your tie on and your coat on and, and you're uh, there in the office or in your home? Are you at the I'm, office? I'm in my office. I'm in my Capitol Hill office, which is uh, doing a bunch of nothing, but I'm deep in the swamp, Frank. I, I need somebody <laughs> to help pull me out of here. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm glad that you could take the time today to be with us. It's, a, a, it's one of the great relationships that we have with our company is with the ATA. And, uh, of course, uh, I reached out to uh, Randy to just wish him the everything well today with the hurricane coming in from the Gulf and uh, hopefully everybody's going to be all right in, uh, in New Orleans and in uh, East Texas uh, and along the path of that hurricane. Uh, speaking about hurricanes and things, we have a little thing about COVID-19 that goes on <laughs> for all of our companies and all of our organizations and has changed our lives here in the past three or four months, five months, six months. Uh, and it's, uh, it's hard to avoid, a to avoid asking about COVID-19 in any kind of interview. So I'm going to start off with it and get it out of the way because even though I'm over COVID-19, it's not over. <laughs> it's still going on and yeah. it's affecting people and affecting businesses and it's affecting trucking every day. So can you just tell me a little bit about the ATA has uh, engaged in, 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 their, in their organization about COVID-19? You bet, and and I agree with you on on the hurricane in Louisiana. Louisiana, something that COVID shares, I think, with Louisiana is, uh, in the worst of times, the trucking industry has to respond as fundamental. We're the glue that holds the economy, the supply chain together. So the work that we did as a trade association was more important during the pandemic. And and some of the, uh, you know, I could talk for hours, but the short version is. Uh, working with our state executives, our 50 state federation of state executives, working with governors, mayors, President Trump, Department of Homeland Security to keep the roads open, to keep the uh, reasonableness surrounding quarantine so truck drivers could keep and companies could keep the, the stock shelved in grocery stores and pharmacies and keep PPE flowing to hospitals. Um, you know, even though the economy was mostly shut down, people still needed food and water and basic necessities of life. And, and that was what we were focused on. So the team at ATA worked harder during the pandemic um, than before. Uh, you know, it was a really important time for us to serve our members. Well, you know, the, the big thing about being uh, essential workers and our company was uh, deemed an essential working company so we stayed open during the entire time and uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to say that we've received uh, most of our furloughed people back uh, they came back to work we uh, we've, we've got a spur in the in the business right now but uh, the challenge is to keep everybody healthy and not just keeping them healthy from an aspect of being here at at their place of work but they've got to be able to carry that beyond the place of work into their homes and their everyday lives. And I was wondering, how do you instruct the people within your organization and get the word out in the trucking industry itself to make this a 24-7 program? You know, we, so within the organization, we are subject, you know, first and foremost to the legal and public health guidance. So for the ATA employees, um, just like CIMC, just like any business, we have had to follow for, for ATA, primarily Arlington County, Virginia, and the state of Virginia and the District of Columbia to 
it, for those who are able and necessary to come to work to be able to come in safely and and to trust that they can come to their work environment so much of the economy and our productivity and our lives depends on that trust the trust that you're not going to get sick and die the trust that somebody that you're interacting with isn't sick or potentially sick and um, a, a number of um, number of members of ours asked ATA to be the voice for those standards and we worked with the truck stop members that we have and the National Association of Truck Stop Operators um, to put the word out about you know basic CDC guidelines and how important it is um, if you're not only sitting in your house particularly but if you're if you're interacting outside of your house how to ensure that you're safe and your family's safe because again this is just basic humanity and basic social needs to to see and 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 or talk to one another and i'm lucky to have a way to talk to you by video but not everybody's job allows them to do that and those who are essential need to stay safe and protect their families we had a number of, of truck drivers who would reach out directly to us some of them america's road team captains working for member companies but also working for ata who would say i've been on the road for a week and i think i've I've been safe, but I'm really worried about going back to my family. You know, how can I make sure? Can I get tested? Um, you know, what do I need to do to be able to protect my my wife or my children or my husband or my grandparents? So um, we have done that, Frank, and I think you all have too there at CIMC. But we we have had to um, serve as a conduit for some of those basic things, we, and we've we've enjoyed. Um, providing during our mid-year sessions, our, our sort of ATA management sessions, um, by video feed, uh, one of the head people at the CDC and another national renowned public health expert uh, to, to help provide real information. Everybody talks about how, you know, how, how where there are bad points of the response and where there's bad information out there. All we want is stuff that's as true and accurate as we can find and that our employees and, and members and, and other Americans have as much access to it as possible. Well, I'll tell you what, it, it, it has been a strain on all organizations throughout our, our industry and throughout the whole United States uh, world, too. I think it was 188 nations uh, have, been, have come down with this. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, but you did mention economy in, in, in what you were talking about. And of course, uh, I don't call it a recession, but I call it this is, a, this is the, uh, uh, the outcome of the epidemic is that we're, things were shut down and things, the, the economy came to a screeching halt. But we have to remember that the economy was roaring before it came to a screeching halt. And it didn't come to a screeching halt because of economic conditions. It came down because of medical conditions and the, the ability to shut down places. So as we come out of that, and we will come out of it, I have to be the, 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 the harbinger of uh, hope here that we are coming out of it or we're going to come out of it. Uh, the crisis will end on, on the health side. Uh, what is your major takeaway of where it's go what's going to happen in the trucking industry when we're trying to build the economy back up to anywhere close? I know the Wall Street is going really crazy and the records are being made, but is this sustainable or are we going to have some kind of a leveling off? Uh, I'd like to take your, 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 your take on it. You know, I, I feel like I feel like um, I we are coming out of a a socially made. I mean, public health was the driver, but government and neighborhoods and cities made the decision to shut down the economy. The economy didn't have to shut down, but um, so I'm a like you. I'm a I'm very bullish on how Americans rise to a crisis and how people, how human beings rise to a crisis. So um, right now, the, the um, you know, and I'll pretend to be an economist. We have our chief economist, Bob Costello, who talks about this around the country and is smarter than I am by a factor of 100. But, um, you know, right now, uh, the freight market is up. And so 
uh, seeing a fairly significant dip start in March. But also, uh, you know, the trucking industry, because it is the glue that holds the economy together, was reflective of the sectors of the economy. And so uh, motor carriers, trucking companies with a very diverse base of business between retail and industrial and, and um, consumer, you know, saw, the, saw a drop in freight. Um, but those who were primarily dependent on manufacturing, where manufacturing plants shut down, uh, took a harder hit, um, you know, also with the supply chains in sort of the USMCA or NAFTA zone throughout North America, you know, was really difficult for companies like CIMC that, that are managing a global supply chain. You know, there were challenges with port activities and, and with demand. Um, so as connected as the economy is, um, the the dip that we saw created by our public health response and what governments told us we could and couldn't do, um, now we see a really significant rebound and the debate about whether it's a V-shaped economy that just keeps going up, 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 you know, sort of in this straight line or whether it bends and plateaus a little here and there. Um, I, I would guess that the sharp rebound that we've seen right now doesn't stay on a linear slope. You know, I would guess that we do see um, how steep that slope will be, how sharp the economic bounce back will be, will absolutely depend on the public health. And so if there are, are hot spots throughout the country, um, throughout the global supply chain, you know, in Mexico and Canada and China and throughout the global supply chain beyond those company, uh, those countries, um, it'll take a little while. But here's the thing it's coming back period and watching restaurants start to open even if outdoor um you know the dynamism of small businesses where small businesses suffer other small businesses come in behind them so we're, we're bullish and i'd be loath to guess exactly how sharp we we rebound but what i can say is everything through now even with some hot spots in you know florida texas and other places arizona um, we, it, the economy keeps on coming. So whether whether we get you know all the way back, I think it'll be really hard to get all the way back to the point where we were roaring just before um, just before the COVID pandemic hit. But we're 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 getting back, and people are getting back to work, and and government support has been an important part of that, and will continue to be. You know, uh, there's been trillions of dollars spent in uh, government aid and assistance. And some of that has had to come into the trucking industry. Uh, do you have a, a thought on how it's helped uh, the trucking industry in, in any way? We, so I, a, a significant number of our members, and we surveyed American Trucking Association members, and I believe the number was around half of our motor carrier, well, of all of our members. It was not just our trucking company members. It was also our allied members, yes. suppliers. But um, yes. I believe more than half, which makes sense because PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program assistance, was for nominally small businesses or businesses with fewer than 500 employees. And um, a number, you know, half of our companies wound up with PPP and needed it and you know the the goal of ppp was a really valuable one which is to keep employees sticky with the companies for whom they work so that when the economy returns there's not a, a major you know drag in the economy of trying to get people hired back but to keep them um keep them together with their companies and so uh ppp we believe was a really important piece I am sure, uh, as some member companies uh, complained that PPP, that a lot of the money was going out, I say a lot, that enough of the money was going out to companies that didn't need it, and that, you know, in a competitive free market, that that's, you know, not a free market response. Uh, you know, what I would tell those who would argue that was, it was vital to our economic health and to individual families and people who are employed, it was vital to get that money out fast. And one thing government does not do well is fast. So the fact that we went out fast and broad meant that most of the money was in the hands of people who really needed it. 
but yeah, there were some people who probably would have been okay without the PPP. I'd rather err in that direction and in the other direction where you have, you know, people potentially um, losing their home or struggling to feed themselves. So um, PPP, we think, has been really successful. And oh, by the way, it passed nearly unanimously through Congress and President Trump signed it. So it, as I've said to Frank before, but I'll say here, uh, one of the biggest parts of this story is how our elected officials, our governors, Republicans, Democrats, everybody came together and did the right thing. And when PPP was run out of money after a couple of weeks, they came back and provided more. So I, I think, you know, the government response, while imperfect, has been striving to answer the needs that people and businesses and communities have. Well, I, I tell you, that was very, very impressive that we got everybody to jump on the same ship for one time, you know, together, uh, uh, instead of being oceans apart. Uh, by the way, uh, right now, we're the best physical distancing you can have. We're one coast to the other coast, and uh, yeah. we're having a great <laughs> conversation. So it's not social distancing, because we're being social, we're talking to each other, and we're discussing some things about the, about the business and the organizations, uh, but we're physically separated. And, and by the uh, electronics and the, the, the great efforts of our engineer over here, Marcos, I'm glad that we were able to put this thing together. Uh, there's one thing that you and I talked about on the phone the other day, and uh, I know we had a great discussion on it, and I thought, I got to bring this up, uh, even though you're going to say, Frank, I just told you all about this, so you know about it, but our, <laughs> our listeners and viewers out there are, are, are probably going to get some education about the federal excise tax and what this is could mean to the trucking industry and what the ATA is working on uh, in conjunction with trying to move the federal excise tax because of COVID-19 and the rest of the economy. Uh, so could you please, for, for me, uh, re-explain it again? You, sure. Um, and, you know, you know, and your listeners probably know that the federal excise tax has been around since World War One, but then never gone away. So a 12 percent tax on, you know, tractors, trailers and, and qualifying equipment, which is a lot of it, it, it to our best guesstimate is about twenty thousand dollars per unit and is a serious drag distorts demand for purchasing new tractors trailers and all the stuff that goes into them engines and and um you know electronics and and chassis and all so it it is a it is a tax where the funds that go into it are spent really well they go into the highway trust fund and we need to spend more on the highway trust fund but the federal excise tax isn't the way to do it uh, we've been working for years to replace to repeal and replace the funds because we don't want to run the federal, the highway trust fund out of money our, our infrastructure is in bad enough shape until we finally decide to reinvest but we have proposed and been working really hard to make the case to lawmakers and the president that the federal excise tax uh, as a mechanism to help the trucking industry and especially our OEMs and suppliers um, climb back out of the recession as healthy as possible um, it is a suspension on the federal excise tax through December of next year and so a one-year suspension on the federal excise tax uh, we think that this is a, a really significant investment and by really significant we're talking about in my mind somewhere in the neighborhood of three to six billion dollars is what the tax would bring in but i mean as i was saying to you frank come on we spent two and a half trillion already we're talking about spending another trillion or two um in assistance you know a, a, a two or three you know or excuse me a three to six billion dollar spend in the against these trillions is really small and the trucking industry hasn't asked for any special free stuff like we're great at not asking for handouts because we're just basic business people who want you know a hand up but not a handout and we don't want bailouts um the the assistance provided has been sufficient so far but we believe pretty strongly that the federal excise tax and suspending it would be a real kickstart for to get the um I know some of our OEMs of the tractor manufacturers 
have seen a 50 per, an average of a 50 percent decline in orders and have slowed production dramatically as a result of the economic dip and this is a great way to get uh, many tens of thousands of jobs direct jobs and manufacturing back up and going and beyond that the suppliers it's you're talking about hundreds of thousands of jobs so um, you know whether you're buying a chassis from CIMC whether you're buying a new you know Freightliner or Kenworth or Peterbilt or Mack or Volvo um, it, it's a really big deal and the motor carriers that are buying this will put newer cleaner um, greener equipment on the road as a result of it and safer equipment on the road so we think it's a win-win-win and are working with the tax writing committees, the Ways and Means Committee in the House, and the um, and the Finance Committee in the Senate to try to see such a thing come into into play. But and I I wouldn't handicap it. I thought we've had a 50-50 shot most of the way, and some days I think 55 percent, some days 45. But um, we hope that Congress will bring another package, assistance package through. Um, you know, unemployment and the Postal Service are two issues that are first in the minds of people in Congress, as perhaps they should be. Um, but this is something that would be a, an important part of helping our industry and the suppliers to our industry climb out of the economic dip that the COVID pandemic has wrought. Well, I think you're, you've, you've hit the nail on, on the head. You're 100% correct about that. You know, in this crazy year of COVID-19, of an election year, of tariffs, of people, 30 plus million people being taken out of work. Not because there wasn't work there, is because you couldn't go to work because you're gonna get sick. All the things that have happened in this year, it seemed to be as negative as could possibly happen in any particular time. And at the beginning of this year, as it was 2020, we thought the vision was going to be clear and, and, and stable and wonderful, and we were just going to go right into 2020 and this decade as one of the stellar decades uh, of our lifetime. Well, we're in the eighth month, and it is not the stellar decade start that we all thought we were going to have. But with that being said, if the federal excise tax was taken off, that's a 12% reduction in price to anybody that's got to buy new equipment and replace old equipment. And I, from a CEO standpoint, I look out and a lot of people need to replace equipment because they're on a cycle of replacement. And whether they're trucking, uh, the trucks, the, the trailers, uh, chassis, or any other vehicles, they need to do that. This would be a great stimulus package to them, and it really wouldn't take away from something else. We do need all the infrastructure to come through, too, from our government. And Congress needs to be and, able know, to work I've, together on that. And let me, let me just pipe up, Frank. It's, it's, it's interesting. You are CEO of a company that supplies things, so I think you have a, a, a more granular sense of what drives the ups and downs of, of order flows and cycles of order flows. You know, it's it's generally in talking to these boring big picture national macro economists, um, you know, that most big companies stick to their order patterns because they get on an order schedule and it's just they have a replacement cycle. But interestingly, someone, a, a really significant member, um, you know, with well more than a thousand trucks in the Midwest was talking to. Um, talking with us and Senator Grassley, who's the chairman of the, of the Senate Finance Committee who makes this decision. And Senator Grassley asked how many trucks they had planned to buy before and how many they planned to buy after. And by the trucks, I mean tractors. And they, they had an order schedule of something more than 600 tractors um, planned in 2020 before. And they had dropped that back down to less than 200. And so I, I didn't realize how uh, how elastic demand or order cycles were. I just assumed larger companies kept, you know, had a lot of financial tools and financing and things that unless they saw a real change in business in the future, if it was a momentary blip, a recession or anything, that they kept their order patterns. But listening to this um, at, at the top of a really big company, talk about changing by more than half their order pattern on tractors 
um, even though they have loans and all these, you know, larger companies have access to credit in a way that smaller companies do not and financial tools. But it was a drastic and that that um, that stuck with Senator Grassley. So, uh, again, I wouldn't predict whether he's in or not, but it's a real issue. And, and to your point, it's a real opportunity to it for policymakers to influence decisions about purchasing, which influence the manufacturing and the jobs and and the flow of the economy. Well, this would definitely bring the economy back faster and trucking usually starts bringing the economy back. Uh, once, uh, you know, right here in, in the Los Angeles port and the uh, 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 Long Beach port, they've been out of chassis at several of the chassis pools because the chassis are not going out one at a time and coming back uh, a day later or the next day. What is happening is the chassis are going out and now they're out for like nine days before they come back with an empty box to pick up another one. So the, the need for, for equipment is there and there is a spike now. And um, Weston, who was on in our, our earlier segment, uh, this spike is going to go through the end of December as far as the, the influx of, of uh, container boxes to, into the United States. It's just going to go on. You know, we do have a Christmas season coming up and so on and so forth, which uh, usually is a peak. may not be as peak as 2018, but it's going to be a peak no matter what. Uh, I, for one, because it is, and I'll, and I'll, I'll time stamp our, our talk today by saying uh, the Democratic uh, convention is over and the Republican will convention will be over tonight and then we're going to get into the debates uh, and then we're going to get into the election and with the talking about the the mail-in ballots and all this other stuff aside I mean there's too much confusion going on anyway to touch on every subject there is but in your in your mind being in Washington DC and what you see um, and I'm not going to ask you to predict who's going to win but if you have a prediction of how things are going to go in the future uh, the voice of trucking is going to be loud and present. What are you going to look for in the debates for the trucking industry? You know, we do not believe that um, that our issues are partisan issues, and so there are, there can be uh, challenges on you know trial lawyers versus trucking, or you know the railroads versus trucking. There are little things, but basically. The trucking industry is is simple, intuitive economic issues of men and women trying to do business, supporting the other businesses in this country that grow our quality of life, our um, you know our communities, our families. So we are looking to see what kind of economic plan um, both uh, Vice President Biden and President Trump lay out, and and we've had a a good working relationship with President Trump, and we talked to both transition teams. Um, it, when President Trump was a candidate and Hillary Clinton was a candidate and um, and we were ready for either because uh, you know we have a strong voice but we don't pick the president and so we have to work with whoever whoever uh, makes the best argument with the American people um, and with with Vice President Biden he has a, a history and and a strong understanding of the economy through a lifetime of public service we have connected with his uh, with his policy folks, um, less so with his campaign folks. We don't get into the campaign stuff here as much with ATA on the presidential level, but uh, we have a level of comfort with them too. So, you know, some of the regulatory work that either candidate is suggesting is important um, matters a lot to our members. Though trucking as a heavily regulated industry is is familiar with regulations and you know worked with the Obama administration, worked with the Bush administration, have worked with the Trump administration, and will work for Joe Biden to win the win the White House. We work with the Joe Biden administration, so um, we have to make the case on why this stuff matters. Uh, it matters a lot, and we we believe we have also had a very close working relationship with both Republicans and Democrats 
in Congress. And so, you know, some of those races that are not for president are really important, too. And um, and the Democrats have been great partners over the last couple of years. You know, Speaker Pelosi has been um, not always on our side on things. There are plenty of places where we may disagree with her. But there have been plenty of places where we disagreed with Paul Ryan when we were working with Republicans leading the House representatives. So, um, you know, it's it's our job to represent the industry to the federal government. Um, and doing that starts by listening to our members and the challenges they face. We supported tax reform. You know, the, the U.S. tax system was a, a, a difficult one that hadn't been changed in a major way in 30 years. And, and they may not have gotten it perfect, but they made some improvements. And, and um, outside of ideological arguments about the very bottom and the very top, I think that the, the tax bill relieved the burden on businesses somewhat. Um, which has which helped propel the economy. You know, the growth that we saw uh, has been really, really impressive. So to your point, the economy was roaring before, and when Donald Trump took office, economists were predicting that the end of 2018, beginning of 2019, was going to be the end of the business cycle and there would be a, re a recession. And, you know, the, the tax changes helped extend, helped people reinvest, uh, helped make sure that... Um, companies that were doing better as a result were spending their tax money in many cases at least in the trucking industry on driver pay um so we we are waiting to see what the debates look like and frank i know you'll you'll have a, you know a bug in our ear as you hear words come out of their mouths about free trade which we believe in and, and you know reasonable taxes and, and you know COVID liability protections and all those things but um you know, we're ready for either, and, and our job is to represent trucking no matter who's there. Well, I'll tell you what, in, in my opinion and opinion of many, many other people, the American Trucking Association is everything to everybody. That's why you are got bipartisan background. You, you can work with Democrats, you can work with Republicans, you can work with any kind of lawmakers that we have, and you fight for the trucking industry and solely the trucking industry and everybody that is associated with it. And, uh, and, and I, I praise the, the organization for it. It's a, not only a class act, but it is a real act that is dedicated to its constituents more so than anyone else. I mean, everybody has their opinions, but my opinion is very high of the American Trucking Association, and I really appreciate you being with us today and being able to come on and, and talk about these things. These are, these are not easy subjects to talk about because there's always the, the yin and the yang or the pro and the con to it. But you, you explained it very well. I, I hope that our, our viewers uh, were able to take something away from this and maybe write their congressman or their senator and say, yes, let's, get, let's, let's ease off the FET. And I'm not even a trucker kind of deal, I'm, but I have everything delivered to my house <laughs> by a truck, you know, uh, whether it's coming from Amazon or whether it's coming from um, Germany. I mean, there's something coming into, the, into my, my, my realm by a truck. So um, hopefully uh, we'll get some of that out and hopefully we get pretty well um, wrap up this part of the session unless there's something that I didn't ask you that you really like to talk about before I get into your personal uh, uh, profile because we always like to <laughs> have the people that get on the seat and tell us uh, what they're doing we'd like to have a few more uh, more intimate questions that uh, uh, I'm gonna ask in a second so I'm giving you a, a, about another 60 seconds to 90 seconds uh, if something that I missed uh, in in asking you about you know, the, the, I would like to say one thing, and that is that the biggest um, misconception about about your government is um, that that it's a, a bunch of sneaky people with bad intentions. And we, I like the people with the red flag or the blue flag, but all those other weasels are, you know, trying to make life worse. <clears throat> From my time working on the Hill, uh, uh, you know, roughly 15 years. And, and then here for another five, but the, or almost five, but is um, nobody comes to Washington, D.C. to make people's lives worse. And I don't care if it's Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Nancy Pelosi, um, you know, people who get into government 
are they're just people and they they may have a really big ego you don't put your name on the ballot if you have zero ego but they're trying to make people's lives better and we we may disagree violently about the best way to do that but but it's it we've lost some sense of benefit of the doubt and as i look at newspapers and watch tv i can't stomach it anymore it's all division amen division, to division. That. amen and, to that yes. and you know, so like to me, the the amazing thing about the pandemic, I mentioned it before, is everybody pulled together. You know, communities, you know, Girl Scout troops taking lunches out to truck drivers who couldn't get to pull up to a McDonald's window. We just help each other out. And Congress is pretty much that way, too. Um, so uh, we need to engage. And, you know, the jobs of trade associations and your mayor and all folk, all types of folks are you know, you get out of government what you put into it. So uh, we, we encourage anybody to, to give a hoot and to give people benefit of the doubt and to, uh, you know, to, to participate. That's my soapbox, and I'm done. All right, well, I really appreciate that. I, I, I wouldn't have had a question that would have required that answer, but that's a great, that's a great <laughs> commentary for you. And uh, I definitely think no matter what, goes on with the ATA, you do have, you're in the right city because you could be a politician. I think you could, you could take <laughs> care of people and make sure that you are doing the right thing for their lives. Bill uh, Natalia, the how are we doing on time? <laughs> we're doing yeah. good. Um, we're going to go take a quick commercial break right now. We'll All right. Be right we'll, be, we'll be right back. Thank you. We'll be right back. All right, we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Frank, back to you. Thank you, Natalia. Well, uh, this is the part of the program that I always like because I like listening to all the great stuff that uh, the ATA has done and, and is, is doing and, and the things that are going on in Washington. But I also like to pull out from you the, the person on the spot right now, uh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, a little bit of personal stuff. And what we do here, uh, we have a uh, categories of sports, music, and we also have a, a thing we call bottoms up. And I'm going to start with sports. In 60 seconds, uh, what is your favorite sport team or uh, a memory uh, that really affects you that, that you can bring to mind right now? So we moved, my wife and I, with a brand new baby, moved to Washington in 2000 from Tennessee. I was a National League geek. A friend of mine pitched for the Braves, a high school friend. And uh, so I was a National League geek, and I just could not stomach going to see the Orioles play. And uh, I did. <laughs> I, I'd take my three-year-old up there. But uh, but I just the, the American League designated hitter, you name it, uh, you know, not popular in the sort of new COVID world. But I just love the National League. So when the Nationals moved here in 2005, uh, it, it just it gave me a, a brand new outlook and had a five year old son. So we have been just complete geeks for the Nationals uh, going down to spring training every year and uh, culminating, Frank, I hope I don't, you know, step on any astro toes here or trash throws or whatever they may be, but uh, culminating in, you know, the the worst beginning to a season in years and then ultimately winning the World Series last year. So, the, uh, you know, it, it's been an amazing ride with the Astros. Uh, 
you know, succumbing to the Nationals last year. But I love the Nationals. Had a blast. Watched them go from horrible to great, and, I and it's get fun. My ball. Uh, yes, oh. one moment. I'm going to be uh, right back here for a second. This is going to be sports oh, yeah, in about, yeah. Don't be, yeah, your mic. What? Your mic. Uh, That's okay. Uh, All right, I know. We'll, we'll let it that part out, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> here we have. Here we have is a, uh, a ball that's up here on the wall. Um, and uh, I'm probably the biggest Astro fan there is. And I have a, we could go on to a whole dissertation mm -hmm. about baseball. But I tell you what, your team won, and your team is a great team. And basically, uh, right down to the last couple seconds, it was, I was hoping and praying. But what, once again, the uh, I was four an Astro fan. Four four home games. What kind of heartbreak is that? I, I, I know. The, uh, <laughs> I know. I, I, have I, the, a, hey. I have it sitting at my house for a, a, an exorbitant sum. A Steven Strasburg signed World Series ball, World Series MVP, two thousand nineteen. But Steven Strasburg and and uh, and the Nats were uh, were it mattered when it mattered, and and uh, you know what a what a Cinderella story when they were at the at the basement, you know, whatever, 18 games below 500 uh, coming out of May. So it, it was a crazy year. No, it was, a, it, it, it was fantastic. And I, and I tell you what, uh, I, I really do. Uh, my, my whole story is I, I was a Lastros fan when they were bottom dwellers all the time. And then through the 80s when they had great players and they missed the playoffs or they missed the to go into the World Series. And then when they did get to the World Series one time, they lost in four games. And you know what? Everybody yeah. was so proud in Houston that they got to the World Series, they didn't even care that they lost in four straight games, you know? <laughs> so when we did win a series against the Dodgers, which I was in California, and everybody is a Dodger fan in our factory, and I made them wear orange vests every day. <laughs> And I'd say, oh, you Astros fans, you're bringing in the orange for me. Uh, that's, that's another story for another, so for another big, podcast. Our, our, big in, our big convention, Frank, you, you know, I, I typically get to see Frank and, and Trevor and the team at our MC&E. So last year, our big convention was in San Diego. But the, the day I was flying to San Diego was the day that the Nationals were playing the Dodgers at Dodger Stadium. Ah. So I switched my ticket, flew into L.A., watched the Nationals whip the crap out of the, <laughs> out of the Dodgers, and then got to sit in the parking lot for two hours before we got out of uh, Chavez Ravine. But oh, yeah. uh, it, it, was a, it was a Cinderella year. Yeah, very, very good. Now for the second personal question here, uh, the music segment. Uh, what is your favorite music uh, 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 group, uh, concert, or anything like that? Is one of the things you put at top of your list? You know the so I'll I'll just uh, I'll keep this on trucking. Uh, I, I you know fifty three years old l loved the eighties and all the horrible music of the eighties and <laughs> uh, and enjoyed a little bit of the music of the of the 70s but uh, I listen to everything from I don't like opera or rap that much but everything else I kind of enjoy but when I started with ATA in 2016 we were a few months away from MC&E &E, and the Freightliner event which as oh, those yeah. who might watch this have been the Freightliner event that year it's kept secret to the last minute but it was a full show for less than a thousand uh, of the Rolling Stones, and so the right. you know who doesn't love the Stones? And it was you know eight or nine hundred of us in a small, tight but wonderful uh, venue inside the bottom of the Bellagio. Absolutely. You know, and I'm I'm ten feet from Keith and Mick. You know, it was just like unbelievable. I know, and I'll tell you what, the ATA always has the best entertainment, and Freightliner always has the best entertainment. Uh, I wish I had either of your budgets. <laughs> <laughs> either of your Let's budgets, just there. one time, just one time Let's get it there. to be able to do that. But uh, yeah, yeah, uh, wonderful. I, it, it, I, and I agree with you. I, I've seen the Stones many times, not from ten feet away, but uh, but I'll tell you what. Uh, What's amazing about them 
is they've had a few, due to deaths and things like this, uh, peop people change. But that group has been together longer than anybody could stand to be with each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's a be the and, best and kind of a still, program. And they still sound unbelievable. Yeah. You know, like the, there, there are people, you know, having seen like Roger Daltrey in The Who, um, you know, at, at, uh, at Outdoor Amphitheater in, uh, if you have a Starwood or Lakewood or whatever, in Atlanta, um, amazing show, but Roger Daltrey can't hit some of that high stuff the way he could. Mick, at 70 years old, you know, or whatever the heck he is, uh, like, yeah. they are as good, they, they are really just about as good as they were 20 years ago. And I, I never had the benefit of seeing them in the 70s, but man, they were, they were amazing. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, that they, they still amaze me, and uh, I, I'll, I'll listen to their stations on a, a serious satellite radio and go, yeah. every song, you know, you know it, you know, I don't care if it's like even their latest albums, I still know everything that they've ever done, so I'm, I'm glad that uh, we can agree, may not agree on baseball, but we agree on the, <laughs> we agree on the Rolling Stones for sure. <laughs> now we agree on baseball. The, the best team always wins. That's always it. Yeah. The best team always wins. That's, now the and last there's always one. hope. The last one here is, is the one that really gets to be soul searching because we call it bottoms up and everybody thinks that's something about like drinking, right? But no, it's about bottoms. When there was something, the lowest part in, in your life or career or whatever that, that you, you had and how you got out of it and, and turned it into a high point. Um, can you let us know what that is? So, you know, and that's a that's a really, I, I love that you do this because that's really important. And anybody who isn't trying really hard and occasionally screwing up and failing isn't isn't really trying hard enough. You know, so I think yes. the, the the disappointments, the disappointments make us make us who we are. But and, and I've had plenty of them. But I, I, I thought, you know, as you and I were, were as you just said, hey, try see what you think. You know, what are some of the tougher points you've had? Um, a more recent example, and one relevant to you and me, is um, in uh, before I had the ATA job, I was working as uh, you know uh, number uh, not the chief of staff, but the next to the chief of staff, the legislative director for Senator Richard Shelby, who's now chairman of the Appropriations Committee, and uh, and it was a great fit. But it uh, what happened actually was. Um, I was recruited by the chairman of appropriations on the House side, a, a Kentucky member named Hal Rogers. Uh, his chief of staff reached out to me and asked if I'd be willing to be his chief of staff. And so I, I evaluated it, talked to him about it, and ultimately didn't get the job. And so I was, you know, one of the final two. Uh, his chief of staff and another even more senior guy who ran the appropriations committee, uh, I think I'm pretty sure both wanted me to get it. But in the end, Hal Rogers picked somebody else, and it was really a disappointing. I, disappointing is an understatement. It was really crushing, and uh, and it led Senator Shelby's office to find out that I might be willing to leave what I was doing at that time. Led me to work for Senator Shelby, which is one of the best jobs and the best fits I've ever had. And it's also where I met Chris Spear, who is the president and CEO of ATA. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to Frank, but for um, not getting the job that I really wanted with Hal Rogers. And so, you know, every, I'm, you know, not to sound silly, but I'm a Presbyterian and I believe things happen, that there's a plan and there's a reason and you, you have to try to figure out what it is. But when things don't go your way, um, how you rise to what comes next is really important. And, and you know, again, it sounds like cliche and sounds smarmy like Hallmark Channel, but, uh, but it's true. And, and I would not be here today uh, were it not for not getting the job um, as chief of staff to the chairman of House Appropriations. Well, I'm certainly glad you're here today, and and you're Me on too. our podcast. Yes. We're it, so happy to have you, Bill. It's yes, so good to see it, you again. It, it's <laughs> wonderful to have you here, and you all, you all as well. Uh, you, you, Frank, you personally, and the business you all run there at, at CIMC are quality people doing quality stuff and I, I say that from the bottom of my heart you are great to work with and um, and uh, try to make people better you know period so uh, Natalia has treated me like a bar of gold when I came out to 
visit you all when you were opening up uh, uh, some new facilities out there. And and you know, thank you for everything you do. Thank you, you for your membership. You are a bar of us. gold. You are a bar of gold. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, we thank you. We thank you for being here today. And uh, the last part before. Uh, I take my tie off and hang it up on the shade to close this, uh, this podcast. Uh, it's kind of like uh, everybody out here in California says, Frank, why do you wear a tie? And I say, because it's, <laughs> it's because it's part of my uniform. My uniform is uh, going to work, having a tie on, call me old school or just call me old, but I don't like that. But <laughs> the whole thing is, when I take the tie off and uh, and, then, and I get home and and I change into some cutoff uh, jeans or something and a uh, and a uh, Astros uh, tank top or something, <laughs> then uh, uh, I know that I've not stopped talking, thinking about business, but I've stopped looking like business, and it gives me a little bit of a relief uh, from the basic. Uh, day schedule. So uh, I'm going to ask you if there's anything on this podcast that because we've done this virtual and this is our first time doing it this way um, that you think we should improve on or add or subtract because uh, uh, I want to make everybody comfortable and anything that you could give us as a, a suggestion we'll use it to make this a better podcast. I, I think your short answer is no, and I've done some other podcasts. I, I think, um, you know, a lot of what we lack is people just having a conversation about things, Frank, and, and I think, you know, honest questions about things that matter are a great way to go, and um, so I, if I come up with something, I'll, I'll send it your way, but as I sit here right now, I think it's a great idea and well done, and, and um, I would say on the tie thing, you know, we wear a tie here in Washington, it, partly because of the theater of, um, you know, government. And government is, it's sort of about respect. You know, as silly as a piece of cloth hanging off of your neck, it's just that you took the extra couple of minutes to look a little bit better um, for somebody else. But also, in this time of COVID, I worry about a lot of the people that work for me. The boundaries of work and not work are bleeding into one another, and people are you know, sitting at home. So I, I think it's really, I think your idea of having that break point to, you know, leave your work uniform behind and put on your, you know, for me, husband, father, you know, dog walker uniform on is pretty important. So good for you. Well, uh, thank you. That's just, uh, just something that I've always done. And uh, now, with that being said, I, I want to thank you so much for being on. Uh, we can elbow, but we're <laughs> there we go. We got a little elbow going on. Uh, no shaking hands. Uh, the idea is uh, we're all in this together and we're going forward together and we're going to make sure that uh, the trucking industry survives no matter what. We have to. And uh, I'll tell you what, if, if that's not one of your favorite ties of all time, if it's not one of your favorite ties of all time, uh, I'm going to have you send it to me. I'm going to put it right with my tie up here as the, as the number six podcast comes to an end. And we ended it up. This happens to be my, my alma mater, uh, Gannon University. And I'm putting it up here for everybody at Gannon because let me tell you this. Out of all the schools in the country that are not back at, at school, Gannon opened up and they're back with all 895 students coming in and doing it. And basically, I really, really, uh, and I sent them a note on it and they sent me a nice little note back, send money. Uh, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, whole, the, the whole thing is Gannon University in, in Erie, Pennsylvania is 100% back and they're going forward and I like that because that is what it's all about. So with Go the tide coming on. Go nights. And I gotta stand up and hold my <laughs> my whole deal here. All <sighs> right. There we go. Run. I'll I'll find a great Washington Nationals World Series tie to send. Hey, perfect. <laughs> That's perfect. Uh, at least I'll have a Washington Nationals tie that I can wear. Uh, when I come to Washington, D.C., and we can actually sit together and have a beer 
not six feet apart, and root for, yeah. <laughs> for the, the champions in uh, 2021 sometime. Because I'm pretty sure I'll be um, in Washington, D.C. in 2021 sometime. I hope so. All right. I'm looking down at my monitor, and, and they've got the camera up here. So thank you, everybody, for uh, listening to this, this podcast. Thank you for being with us. Bill, and uh, we really appreciate uh, Weston that was here earlier on. Thank and uh, look for this podcast on Intermodal TV on YouTube. Uh, that's our channel. And uh, we will talk to you later. And God bless everybody. Stay safe, stay healthy, wash your hands, and keep the faith. Bye. God Thank bless. you, Frank. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you so much, Thanks, Bill. Guys. That was great. That Bye. was great. It was Bye. absolutely God great. God bless.